Have you ever wondered if the sun is healthy for you or if it's bad for you? Is that beautiful bronzy tan good for you? Or can it be one of the most dangerous things that you can do to your body? What about sunscreens? Are they effective? Are they good for you? Are they bad for you? Do they prevent skin cancer or do they cause skin cancer? Well, it's time to find out. Hey there guys, welcome back to my channel. Today we are going to talk a very special topic that is very dear to me and that is sun exposure and sunscreens. I've seen many videos on this topic here on YouTube and on the internet but they seem to clash with each other because some people claim that sun exposure is okay for you then others say it's dangerous and you should use sunscreen then others say sunscreens are bad for you and toxic and carcinogenic and so on so I decided to go online and do some research and make a video about sunscreens and sun exposure so I as well didn't know anything about this topic up until a few years ago when I started reading blogs and posts and articles uh, that said that the sun is dangerous and we should avoid it and we should use sunscreen so I read all those things and I went online and I watched uh, different videos and of course I started reading medical studies and I started to educate myself on this topic. And now that I've read so much about this topic, I would like to share this information with you guys. I'm sure that you too are wondering about sun exposure, skin burns, skin cancer, skin aging, vitamin D, using sunscreens and their safety. So that's why I made this video, because also there aren't so many videos here on YouTube that would cover all these topics in one go. And so I hope that my video is going to answer the majority of your questions about this topic. Just a quick disclaimer, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a scientist, I'm just someone who loves reading research and studies about healthy living but I do have a bit of medical background and by the way I will list all the research and all the studies that I have found all the links and references in the description box below uh, that will be the majority of them because I cannot list them all because there are too many and there are many more studies available online so make sure you check them out for yourself as well and of course if you want to ask something or disagree with something that I'm saying you are free to do that in the comments box below. Uh, I'm glad that you will ask or comment or I don't know, talk and discuss. That's why I have this channel so we can discuss and we can educate ourselves and I hope my channel will become this place of education. Now I do realize that this is a very long video and that's why I've created click shortcuts. You can find them in the description box below and they will take you to different topics and subtopics of this video so you can skip some or return to some if you wish so. Okay and now that this long epic intro is over it's time to begin with the video. So go grab a snack, come back and enjoy. We all know that the sun is vital for our existence. It gives us light, it keeps us warm, it makes us happy and it makes vitamin D in our skin. So there is no question, we people need the sun for our existence. However, not all of the sun's rays are good for us humans. There are many different types of sun's rays like visible light, infrared radiation and UV radiation and all of these uh, radiation types have their specific wavelengths and energy and these have specific effects on our skin and our, on our body. For example, visible light are the rays that range from 390 nanometers up to 700 nanometers and they make it possible for us to see things, so they are very important. Infrared radiation are the rays that range from 700 nanometers to 1 millimeter in wavelength and they are basically the rays that keep us warm. And then of course we have those famous UV rays which are divided into UVA, UVB and UVC rays and they can have positive but also negative effects on our body. The UV rays divide into many different categories but the three most important ones for this video are the ones that I've already mentioned 
so the UVA, UVB and UVC. The UVC rays are the most damaging of all the UV rays simply because they have the most energy. But luckily for us humans, the UVC rays are absorbed by the atmosphere, so they cannot hurt us. The UVB rays are a little bit longer than UVC rays, and their wavelengths are from 290 to 315 nanometers. They are biologically more active than the UVC rays because they reach the Earth's surface, and they still have a lot of energy, so they can burn our skin. So, the UVB rays are responsible for burning, B for burning, and consequently they lead to many types of skin cancer. However, they are also important for vitamin D production, and this is one of the most important vitamins for us humans. One important thing to know about the UVB rays is that they are mostly absorbed by the clouds and by windows, so in these conditions we don't get burned so easily. And the last category of UV radiation are the UVA rays and these are from 350 nanometers to 400 nanometers and they represent 95% of all the UV radiation that reaches the Earth's surface and that's because the UVC and the UVB rays are almost completely filtered out but by our atmosphere. The UVA rays don't have as much energy as the UVB or the UVC rays but they penetrate much deeper into the skin and now we know that they cause skin aging and also contribute to skin cancer. One important thing to know is that the UVA rays are not very well absorbed by the clouds or by windows so they can reach you even on a cloudy day even when you're inside. Now in order to prevent unnecessary UV damage to our body we need to know when the UV exposure is high and when the UV exposure is low. And that's why the UV index was developed. The UV index is an international measurement or a standard that tells us how much UV there is at a specific location and at a specific time. And it goes from 1 up to 11 plus. And the 1 means the lowest UV exposure and the 11 plus means very harsh, dangerous UV exposure. For example, now that it's a sunny day, it might be a UV index of 7 or 8, and then when it's cloudy in winter, there might be a UV index of 1 or 2. Now the factors that affect the UV index and also the amount of UV presence are uh, time of the year and the time of the day, then latitude, altitude, clouds and haze. So in summer there's more UV than in winter and also in midday there's more summer than for example in the morning. Then also uh, the higher you go up, so in the mountains, there's also more UV than uh, at sea level because the atmosphere has uh, less time and less distance to absorb the UV. And also with latitude, the more you go away from the equator, the less the presence of the UV, so the lower the UV index. And then we have clouds and haze, which also lower the UV index and the amount of UV. So it is important to check the UV index for that day for your location and make sure that you protect yourself from the sun accordingly. Now we humans have different skin colors and because of this pigmentation of our skin, different levels of melanin, we are able to withstand different amounts of time in the sun. There is a special scale called the Fitzpatrick scale and in this scale we have six different types of skin uh, according to the level of pigmentation and one being the fairest skin with no pigmentation and then six being the skin with most pigmentation, so the darkest skin. And the scale also tells us how long we can stay outside without protection until we burn and how our skin will respond to UV damage. If you have light skin, it is important to know that your skin is very sensitive to the sun and you cannot withstand the sun for a long period of time. And you have to protect yourself because your skin only has a small SPF built in it due to the lack of 
uh, melanin production. However, it is also important to know that the darker skin types are not immune to UV damage and that's because their uh, SPF is a little bit higher but not too much. Fair skin types have an SPF around uh, 3 to 4 and then the darkest skin types have an SPF of 13 to 14. So that means that's not a whole lot of protection. Either way, you are not immune to the sun's rays and you have to protect yourself. One of the most dangerous consequences of sun exposure is of course skin cancer and we know three uh, different types or the three most common types of skin cancer are basal cell carcinoma, then we have squamous cell carcinoma and of course melanoma which is the most dangerous type of skin cancer. The reasons for developing skin cancer are long-term inflammation, scarring, trauma to your skin and of course unnecessary UV exposure uh, and that goes especially for basal cell carcinoma. All these reasons and all these factors can cause mutations of the DNA and if it's not repaired by your cells then that means cancer. And parents be especially careful with your children because sunburns and skin damage in the childhood is so much worse than later on in life because if it happens in their, in their childhood that means that there's a bigger chance of developing skin cancer at a younger age. I won't talk about basal cell carcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma in this video. If you want to read about that topic then go online and read some uh, online articles. But I will touch on melanoma. Uh, melanoma is the most dangerous and most deadly type of skin cancer and it can affect anybody. We don't know the definitive primary reason for developing uh, melanoma, but many scientists link it also to UVA radiation because the UV rays, as we said, penetrate much deeper into the skin and that's where the melanocytes, so the skin cells that produce melanin, are located. And when they go carcinogenic, that's uh, what we call melanoma. However, what we do know is that melanoma can develop anywhere. It can develop on your face, it can develop on your head, on your lips, on your neck, behind your ears, uh, on your body, on your arms, on your legs, even under your nails. And that was the case with Bob Marley. He died of melanoma and he had a little spot under his nail and he was too late. He didn't figure it out that it was melanoma and sadly he passed away. So recognizing the risk factors and preventing melanoma is the best way to treat it. So that means you have to go to your dermatologist and uh, he must do a check on your skin and he must check every scars, every bumps, uh, every moles, every spots you have so, and make sure that you don't develop melanoma in the future. If you have any bumps, moles, spots, scars, non-healing wounds, burns, actinic keratosis and other abnormalities, then you have to go to your dermatologist and let yourself get checked. But to recognize actual melanoma, you have to remember the ABCDE rule and it goes like this. A stands for asymmetry and that means if you have any spots that are asymmetric, that's maybe a sign of melanoma. Then B stands for border and that means if you have an uneven border, if it's not round, if it's kind of a weird shape like a map or a splotch or anything else, that is also a sign of melanoma. Then C stands for color. If you have a spot that is multiple colors or it's a weird color like red or uh, green or purple or something like that, get yourself checked. Then D stands for diameter and that means that if your spot is bigger in diameter than a diameter of a pencil eraser that may be a sign of melanoma. And the last one is E and E stands for evolving. If your spots are getting bigger and if your moles are getting bigger or bumpier that is also a sign of melanoma and you have to visit your dermatologist. Of course different people have a different tendency to develop melanoma and the risk factors are skin type, so that means if you have fairer skin, that means a higher uh, a possibility of developing melanoma. Then we have personal history. 
if you had uh, melanoma before, that means that it will likely come back. Uh, then different strange moles or spots, these are also uh, uh, kind of abnormal and you have to pay attention to them. And then we have a weakened immune system. That means if you have HIV, you're more, more likely to develop melanoma. And then of course, last but not least, UV exposure. If you have uh, sunburns and if you expose yourself to the sun's rays regularly, that means that uh, the chances are of course higher. The simple rule here is that you have to check yourself out every month and get yourself checked by your dermatologist every year, especially if you are uh, fair skinned with a lot of spots, a lot of moles and a lot, a lot of freckles because it is better to be safe than sorry. What exactly is photoaging? It is the breakdown of skin tissue, skin cells, slower regeneration, slower functions, and all these things result in uh, wrinkles. And then we also have uh, pigmentation, and all these things are a consequence of UV damage. So photoaging means skin's aging because of the sun's rays. Did you know that an estimated 90% of the skin's aging is due to the photoaging effect? and 25% of this photoaging takes place in the first 20 years of our lives. So which UV rays are actually responsible for the photoaging? Remember that the UVB rays cause burning and the UVA rays cause aging. And that's logical because the UVA rays go much deeper into the skin where collagen and elastin are and they break down this, these collagen structures and cause abnormalities in elastin production and the collagens are the molecules which make up, they, they are basically the building blocks of our, our skin. And if you break them down, you get wrinkles. And if you break down uh, elastin molecules, uh, that means that you will lose your firmness. Your skin will become saggy. It won't snap back into its place. It will sag down. And so all these effects, so saggy skin and wrinkles, these are all the signs and the effects of photo aging. The UVA rays also cause uh, pigmentation spots or age spots and these spots of pigment are the result of DNA damage in your skin cells. It is the way uh, how the cells prevent further skin damage and how they defend themselves once the damage has already been done. Uh, they are not pretty and they are actually quite expensive and hard to remove. And do you know where the age spots are most common? That's right! Here, on your hands. Also remember that the UVA rays penetrate clouds and windows so if you're outside, outside on a cloudy day or if you're driving a, a car that means that the sun's rays are still hitting you and still are causing photo aging. What's interesting to me is that recent studies also indicate that infrared radiation A also causes photo aging because it damages the collagens in your skin and oxidation in your skin and that's why the antioxidant levels in your skin drop when you irradiate skin with infrared radiation A. So that's also, uh, that's also why it's so important to eat antioxidant rich foods in order to minimize photo aging. And of course avoiding UV as much as possible. Tanning is the darkening of the skin and it is the process when melanocytes in our skin produce melanin, so that's the pigment in our skin. And this is their way of protecting themselves uh, and other uh, skin cells from further UV damage. And we know two types of tanning. We know tanning caused by UVA and then we also know tanning caused by UVB rays. The first type of tanning is the UVA tanning and it goes like this. The UVA tanning starts by UVA rays going into your skin and creating free radicals or reactive oxygen species and these cause oxidative stress and that means that they destroy uh, the surrounding tissues and they also oxidize the melanin that's already there and also release it from the storages in your skin cells. So that means no new uh, melanin is produced 
it is only released into the skin and oxidized so that means it's darkened and then we have the tanning via UVB rays and these UVB rays uh, cause burning of the skin and also induce uh, DNA damage it, uh, it is something that's called pyrimidine dimers our skin cells respond to that DNA damage with the initiation of the production of new melanin so new melanin is being made and then once it's made and released, it is furthermore uh, oxidized by the UVA rays. So for us to tan, direct damage to the DNA is necessary. And if that DNA damage is not repaired, we have a mutation, which can lead to cancer. Both UVA and UVB rays cause cancer in this way, so they are very dangerous. And if you didn't know, UV, so ultraviolet radiation, is actually a very well-known carcinogen and it is in the same category as cigarette smoke. And as we said, the UVA also ages your skin prematurely, so even though you might have a beautiful tan, your skin won't look great. The tanning era where everybody laid out in the sun and tanned as much as they could, that era is over because now we know how damaging the sun really is to our skin. I hope I don't have to explain how dangerous and how life-threatening indoor tanning beds are. Many people still use indoor tanning beds, you know, those beds where you go inside and then you are irradiated with UV to tan. These are among the worst things that you can do for your body, for your skin, and also the most dangerous ones. And here uh, they actually are talking about banning them because they consider tanning beds uh, a health problem, a public health problem. We have to know that there is no such thing as a safe tan. Vitamin D is one of the most important vitamins in our body and it has multiple roles for us humans. For example, the most important role of vitamin D is its, uh, is its role in the absorption and regulation of calcium. So we need vitamin D in order to absorb calcium and that calcium is necessary, of course, for our bones. If you are vitamin D deficient, then you may develop osteomalacia uh, or rickets in children, and that means abnormal uh, bone growth in children, and bone fractures and other serious problems in adults. Research also indicates that vitamin D is also important for uh, normal immune system function, normal cognition, and cancer prevention. But scientists still don't know everything about vitamin D and its functions in the human body. So you might ask, where do we get vitamin D? Well, there are two major sources of vitamin D for us humans. The first is food, like uh, meat, eggs and fortified foods uh, with vitamin D, such as fortified uh, milk or fortified orange juice or supplements. And then the second major source is UV light, UVB light. We humans are able to make our own vitamin D and our skin on a clear sunny day with bare skin so no windows or no clouds and the UVB will make vitamin D in our skin. The peak of vitamin D synthesis happens between 295 and 297 nanometers so that is the UVB region. Once the vitamin D is made in our skin, then it travels to our kidneys and our liver and then there is biologically activated and then it can be used and it's used as a hormone. Many scientists say that it's actually a hormone and not a vitamin. Intoxication with vitamin D through sunlight is almost impossible because there is a negative loop system which inhibits further vitamin D production uh, when it reaches maximum. So at the maximum vitamin D production, the vitamin D starts degrading faster than it's being synthesized. And now you ask, well, how much sunlight should I get? How much sunshine should I get per day to synthesize enough vitamin D for my needs? And I have to say this is a complicated question because not all people make vitamin D equally fast. Remember that we talked about how different skin types have different uh, levels of pigmentation and the more pigment you have, the more you absorb the UV light. And it's the same here. The more pigmented your skin is, so the darker your skin tone, the longer you need to stay outside to produce the same amount of 
vitamin D than paler skin because paler skin has no protection uh, through melanin and that means that the vitamin D is going to be produced quicker, faster. Now researchers and doctors are still not sure how much sunlight each specific uh, skin type group needs in order to produce uh, sufficient amounts of vitamin D. Plus, spending your time outside in the sun increases your risk of developing uh, skin cancer. So many professionals suggest that you get your uh, vitamin D through your diet. If that is not possible, then supplements are the next best choice. You get your vitamin D and you don't risk getting skin cancer. Now, I won't comment on how much vitamin D you should get per day because different organizations and different institutes uh, advise and recommend different amounts of vitamin D. Uh, but if you are worried about your vitamin D levels and want to take supplements, then go and talk to your physician. Sunscreen is one of the last steps that professionals recommend for preventing sun damage and for decreasing your risks of developing skin cancer. And now these are the steps to healthy sun care. My first tip would be eat healthy foods rich in antioxidants such as fruits and vegetables. There is no question about it. Antioxidants, if you eat them, help reduce the UV damage and make your skin heal faster. My second tip would be don't burn or tan. Be especially careful with children and babies because we know that's a lot worse to get burnt at a younger age than uh, older and be especially careful when you go to the seaside or if you are doing some winter sports because water and snow reflect a nice portion of the UV rays so that means you can get a sunburn from upside and from the downside so that means double portion ouch tip number three would be seek shade whenever possible but especially between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m when the sun's rays are the strongest. My fourth tip would be cover up. Use UPF protective clothing if you can, but otherwise also use long sleeves, long trousers, use hats and wear sunglasses so you cover up uh, as much area as possible. You must also know that different types of clothing, so different fabrics and different colors, absorb UV light differently. So uh, the factors of UV absorption of your clothing are wave, weight, stretch, color and wetness. Essentially, the more dense the fabric is and the darker, the more UV rays it absorbs. So that means dark jeans absorb UV light far better than a white cotton shirt or a dry cotton shirt absorbs UV far better than a wet cotton shirt. So if you're wearing a white shirt, a white t-shirt to the seaside or to the pool to protect yourself in the water, that's not okay and you will most likely get a burn. Also, if you are working near a window, think about getting a UV filter installed on your windows. So that way most of the UV light will be absorbed, but, but most of the visible light will still penetrate inside. Now here comes the tip number five. Use a well-formulated broad spectrum sunscreen rated SPF 30 or higher and use it liberally and apply often. Furthermore, if you want to increase your protection against the free radicals that do form in your skin, use a topical antioxidant serum daily. Number six, examine yourself and your loved ones every now and then. Best would be every month. Look for the A, B, C, D, E signs of melanoma. And number seven, have your annual skin check done by your dermatologist, especially if you have fair skin with a lot of spots. What is a sunscreen? It's a cosmetic preparation that helps us protect our skin from harmful UV rays. Already in ancient times, people knew that the sun was damaging to our skin, so they used plant oils with antioxidants and minerals like zinc oxide to protect themselves from the sun. And now modern sunscreens originate from the first half of the 20th century. The first sunscreens developed by humans in the 20th century protected only against the UVB rays, so the burning rays. Then came the time when uh, the SPF measurement method was developed and then came the era 
when people notice that the UVA rays are also damaging to the skin. So filters against the UVA rays were also developed. Then people started developing water resistant sunscreens and now it is the era of modern sunscreens. Sunscreens which are effective, broad spectrum, stable, safe and they also have elegant texture. SPF is a measurement that tells us how much of the UVB rays the sunscreen filters out. SPF of 5 means that the sunscreen lets through one fifth of the UVB rays. So that means 20% of the UVB rays are let through and the sunscreen filters out 80% of the UVB rays. SPF of 10 protects us against 90% of the UVB rays. SPF of 25 protects us against 96% of the UVB rays. Here you have a table which will tell you what percentage of the UVB rays each SPF number filters out. You might have heard many people saying that the SPF number stands for the time that you can spend in the sun without burning. For example, some people say that if you burn in 5 minutes and then if you use a sunscreen with an SPF of 10, you can stay in the sun for 10 times longer. So 5 times 10 means 15 minutes without burning. However, I must disappoint you, this theory is sadly not true and let me explain why. The sunscreen actives in sunscreens are not 100% stable and that means when you go outside into the sun and you wear sunscreen, that sunscreen, the sunscreen actives are slowly getting destroyed by the sun instead of your skin cells. Now some sunscreen actives are more stable than other sunscreen actives but even the best sunscreen actives we know at this moment are not 100% stable, they still are getting destroyed and that theory that the SPF number is basically the time protection factor is not true because sunscreen actives are not 100% stable and that's why on every sunscreen that you will buy you will find the instructions to reapply your sunscreen every now and then usually every 2 hours or every 3 or 4 hours whatever the instructions tell you also, every sunscreen is tested for its SPF number. That means that every sunscreen that is sold right now is tested on humans and so we know for sure that the sunscreens are effective. But wait, if the SPF number gives us information about the UVB protection, then what about the UVA rays? Well, there are no real standards for UVA testing and there are many different ways how to test uh, the UVA protection factor and they depend on the area where the sunscreens are sold. So here are just some of them. The first UVA testing method is the PPD method or the persistent pigment darkening method. This is also tested in vivo, so that means on humans. It's basically the same like testing for the SPF number only that the SPF number is testing the burning of the skin and the PPD method is testing for the pigmentation of the skin, so pigment developing. That means, again, what is the percentage of the filtered UVA rays? The next method of testing the UVA protection is the PA plus method or the protection factor A method. This method is based on the previous method, so the PPD method, and these, there are basically four different categories of the PA rating. We have PA1+, we have PA2+, PA3+, and PA4+. And 1 plus means the PPD between 2 and 4, 2 pluses mean a PPD between 4 and 8, 3 pluses mean a PPD between 8 and 12, and 4 pluses mean the PPD between 12 and 16 or more. 
This system is usually used in Japan, but you can also find it on some American sunscreens. The next method is the SPF equivalence method, and this method is used in Europe. This method looks at two things. The first thing is that the sunscreen must be broad spectrum. And the broad spectrum sunscreens are the ones that filter out the UV rays from 290 nanometers to 370 nanometers. And this 370 nanometer wavelength is the critical wavelength, and that means that the sunscreens who surpass this test filter out at least the 90% of all the UV rays that come to the Earth. And then the second standard of this method is that the UVA protection factor must be at least one third of the UVB protection factor. So that means the one third of the SPF number. If the sunscreen surpasses both of these standards, then manufacturers can put a big circle on the packaging with the word UVA written in it. And then the fourth system for UVA rating is the Boots star rating system. This is a five star rating system, uh, one star meaning lowest UVA protection and five stars meaning the best UVA protection. Now I have sent an email to Boots for a more thorough explanation on this UVA rating system but sadly they didn't respond with anything smart so I'm very disappointed in that but just know that three stars is the minimum in Europe and five is the best protection you can get. It has gotten hot in here. Okay, now we will talk about the sunscreen actives. So we have two different types of sunscreen actives and these are chemical sunscreen actives and mineral sunscreen actives. The chemical sunscreen actives are also called organic sunscreen actives, uh, not because they are organically produced or farmed or anything like that. The organic just means that they have carbon inside of them and the mineral sunscreens are also called physical sunscreens or inorganic sunscreens. We know many different types of chemical sunscreens, but we only know two types of mineral sunscreens, and these are zinc oxide and titanium dioxide. Chemical sunscreens work by absorbing into your skin, and then they absorb the UV rays and they scatter them out, and also turn them into infrared radiation. So that means they turn it into heat. Mineral sunscreens, on the other hand, don't absorb past the uppermost layers of your skin and they mostly reflect and absorb, but also scatter the UV light that comes from above. Also, one big difference between these two kinds of sunscreens is that the chemical sunscreens usually absorb only a smaller portion of the UV spectrum and that's why uh, sunscreen makers have to include so many into a sunscreen for it to be broad spectrum. Whereas with mineral sunscreens, uh, they are usually broad spectrum. So zinc oxide and titanium dioxide, if they are formulated carefully, they are broad spectrum and they offer fantastic UVA protection, especially zinc oxide, which is far better for UVA protection. Now each of these sunscreen actives has its characteristics. So that means its stability and absorbance, how well it absorbs uh, certain wavelengths of UV. And the modern chemical filters are usually broad spectrum and very stable. So that means that they absorb a lot of UV light and they are stable for a longer period of time. Here in Europe, sunscreens are considered a cosmetic ingredient, so uh, cosmetics, but in the US they are considered a drug. So it's a huge difference between a cosmetic product and a drug product to go out to the market. A drug product will uh, demand more studies and a lot of more research uh, before it can go to the market. And that's why these newer and effective filters like Tenosorb S, Tenosorb M and Juvenal A+, uh, which are available here in Europe, are not available in the USA, simply because there is not enough research and data, uh, like long-term studies and effects on humans, to go past the FDA and to the market. In the US, there are 16 or 17 FDA-approved active ingredients 
and currently only eight of them are being used because the rest of them are not as effective nor as safe as the other ones. The eight most commonly used sunscreen ingredients in the US are octocrylene, octane oxide, octisalate, homosalate, oxybenzone, avobenzone, titanium dioxide and zinc oxide. And only two of these eight are broad spectrum or UVA protecting chemicals or filters. And these are avobenzone, which is a chemical filter, and then we have zinc oxide, which is a mineral filter. Here in the EU, we have 12 more chemicals which offer fantastic UVA protection or even broad spectrum protection from the sun's rays. These are usually a few different types of tinosorb, then uvinol and also mexorol. And these molecules protect us, with, like I said, with broad spectrum protection and they also have fantastic stability compared to these other filters used in the US. I'm not saying that these US chemical filters are bad or that they don't work, it's just that the new, these newer updated filters are better at protecting you against the UVA rays and they offer a greater UVB and UVA balance and they are far more, more stable and they are less irritating and safer so the FDA should really approve some of these filters so that the US population can use them as well. Now because these chemical filters are absorbed into your skin the fear is that they would absorb too far into the bloodstream and then they would be distributed throughout the body and cause damaging effects on your body. There is no question that some of these filters like oxybenzone do absorb partially into your skin in minor concentrations and then they have for example estrogenic effects which are not great. Uh, they, some of the chemical filters do generate free radical damage some of them uh, cause irritations and allergies. So of course everyone is worried about the safety of these chemical sunscreen filters. One thing that I will say about the safety of these chemicals is that these negative side effects of the chemical sunscreens are minor compared to the amazing benefits of using them. For example, if we are talking about the estrogenic effects of these sunscreens, let me ask you one other question first. Have you ever thought about the estrogen you eat in your food? It's more likely that the estrogenic effects occur from all the food we eat, so all the processed food, all the junk food, and not of these sunscreens. Also, the statement that they generate free radical damage is kind of uh, a little bit over the top, because if they generated more uh, free radical damage than prevented, then we would get burnt, and we don't we are protected and that means that they are effective and they generate less uh, free radical damage than we would have if we were not about to use chemical sunscreens. It is true however that they can cause irritation and allergies and I have experienced this myself. I have tried some American sunscreens with their actives and they have irritated my skin especially around the eyes and I felt a burning so this is true, they are quite irritating on some people, especially on those with sensitive skin. Now if we look at the EU chemical filters, they are much safer, so that means less irritating, more photostable, they have no estrogenic effects on the human body, but it is true that they, there is less research about them. So it's kind of funny to me that the FDA wants safer sunscreen actives, yet the sunscreen actives they approve are not as safe as the newer ones, so I know what to think about that. Anyway, the US chemical sunscreens are very good and they can be very effective and the only real downside is that they are not as effective in the UVA range because they only have two uh, active ingredients which filter out UVA rays and these are as we said avobenzone and zinc oxide. Now speaking of zinc oxide, Let's talk about mineral sunscreen actives for a moment. Mineral sunscreens are little particles of zinc oxide and titanium dioxide and they are approved everywhere. 
so that means worldwide also in the US. They generally have a better safety record than chemical sunscreens just because they don't absorb as deeply as the chemical sunscreens and they don't cause irritation so they are perfect for those with sensitive skin types. They usually also have better stability than chemical sunscreens. And what's also important, as we said, is the fact that zinc oxide offers excellent UVA protection. Now, these zinc oxide and titanium dioxide particles can be ground down to different sizes. And that means normal size, non-nano, then they can be micronized, then they can be nano and so on. Now these different sizes of these particles have different properties and characteristics. For example, smaller particles better absorb the UVB rays, but the larger particles better absorb the UVA rays or vice versa. And then, so the UVA and the UV balance is different with size. And then also smaller particles have, uh, don't have as, as good of a stability as the bigger particles in sunlight simply because the bigger particles are more rigid. There are also other properties, for example, uh, the smaller the particles, the deeper they penetrate into the skin, but uh, none of them penetrate uh, deeply enough that they would be absorbed into the blood. Mineral sunscreens, but especially the bigger particles of the mineral sunscreens are far better for the environment than the chemical sunscreens and the smaller particles, simply because if uh, you go surfing, uh, they are better for the corals and for the environment and they don't destroy it, so that's nice if you're going to the seaside. And many times these smaller particles are also coated in different materials such as carnauba wax, jojoba wax, then beeswax, it can be coated in aluminum or some types of uh, dimethicone and silicones and that gives them stability and they are uh, not as small anymore and they are uh, inert and they cannot absorb into the skin and are much safer also for the environment. Chemical sunscreens and mineral sunscreens can also be used together to form hybrid or mixed sunscreens and they are very effective as well. Now the problem with the mineral filters for some people are these tiniest nanoparticles. So these are the smallest particles that you can get with a grounding and these are uh, most popular types of zinc oxide and titanium dioxide simply because they don't leave a white cast on your uh, arms and on your body and on your face when you put it on. They are more elegant and easier to use and they have a better absorbance of the UVB rays so it's easier to reach a high SPF with them but some people are afraid that they are so small that they could absorb into the skin and into the blood and cause uh, different uh, negative side effects. However, I must say that first of all, they are probably coated with some kind of the different material like I've mentioned before. So they are safe and they are not leaving those materials and cannot be absorbed into the skin. And secondly, research has shown that even these smallest types of particles cannot be absorbed through the skin simply because our skin's uh, matrix and uh, all the barriers are too rigid to let even these tiniest uh, particles through the skin. However, they can be a big problem if you inhale them and they can cause serious damage to your lungs and your system. That's why you have to be so careful with spray sunscreens and with mineral loose powder uh, sunscreens or uh, even makeup powders which uh, come in you know, that loose form which you can buff on. Those types of products can be inhaled and they can cause serious damage to your lungs. So you have to be extra careful if you are using them. Do not inhale them because they can damage you. It is also worth noting that the nanoparticles are not the best for the environment because some of them were found in fish. So if you are going to the seaside and you decide to wear a mineral sunscreen, choose a non-nano sunscreen or choose a coated sunscreen or something like that to protect the environment as well. There are many different textures and forms of sunscreens. For example, we know sprays, we know creams, we know uh, lotions, we know gels, we know fluids, and we also know loose powders. In terms of safety, I'd say avoid the chemical sunscreens and the spray form, simply because you can inhale it and that's not okay. And also, if you're putting it on, 
you are most likely to under apply it. And then also, if you're using mineral sunscreens, avoid loose powder forms and spray forms because of the same reason, because you can inhale them. Otherwise, it is up to you to choose the texture of your sunscreen. Creams will be best for dry skin, lotions will be best for uh, normal to dry skin, then gels will be best for combination skin types and fluids will be best for oilier skin types or skin types that are prone to acne breakouts. The only rule here is that you have to find your own favorite sunscreen and the texture which works for you. I, for example, have dry skin, but, it, but I still love using lightweight fluid or gel sunscreens because they feel nice and uh, light on my face. If you are worrying about the effectiveness of uh, a certain texture of the sunscreen, for example, if you think that a cream sunscreen is working better than a fluid sunscreen, you don't have to worry because, as we said, every sunscreen must be tested for its SPF performance and UVA performance as well, so every sunscreen that is sold on the market is effective. Water-resistant sunscreens are different than normal sunscreens because they stay on you for a longer period of time once you put them on and they have dried. Also, when you go swimming with water-resistant sunscreens, they will wash off much slower than normal sunscreens, so you are protected for a longer period of time. However, that doesn't mean you don't have to reapply. In the US, sunscreens can either have no water resistance, or they can be water resistant up to 40 minutes, or water resistant up to 80 minutes. In the EU, on the other hand, they can have no water resistance or they can be water resistant or very or extra water resistant. This water resistance is achieved through different ingredients which don't mix very well with water and they actually repel water and don't dissolve in water. So these are going to be your waxes and oils and uh, butters. So these are uh, best for drier skin types and then you have your silicones and these are going to be best for oilier skin types. So every skin type can find a water resistant sunscreen for the seaside, for the pool or for doing some sports. In order to achieve the SPF rating stated on the sunscreen packaging, you have to apply 2 mg of sunscreen per square centimeter. And what that means? For example, for the face, for an average face, you have to apply 1.25 milliliters of sunscreen or one quarter uh, of a teaspoon of sunscreen. If you don't know what a quarter of a teaspoon looks like, then you should buy these measuring spoons. I got these uh, in my drugstore for one and a half euros, so they are very cheap. And this smallest one is one quarter of a teaspoon. But don't think that this is a small amount. This is actually quite difficult to apply to your face and in my next video you will see what one quarter of a teaspoon of the sunscreen looks like on my face. I actually have a bit of a bigger face and uh, this would be actually not enough so I actually apply more sunscreen. Uh, it's quite a lot of sunscreen. Then the same amount of sunscreen should be used on your neck and also again the same amount on your chest if you have it exposed. Some scientists and dermatologists even suggest using a full teaspoon of product on your face, neck and chest. And of course you should not forget about your ears and the backside of your hands and every bit of skin that is exposed. By the way, be really careful about your hands because they give away your age. If you are at the seaside and if you are wearing minimal clothing, that means a swimsuit, you should apply at least an ounce or a shot glass or 30 milliliters of product to your entire body. That means your face, hands, body, I don't know, legs or even more. I'm a bit taller so I need uh, something like 35 or even 40 milliliters of uh, sunscreen on, for my entire body. So, you know, if you're a bit taller then rather use a bit more than get a sunburn. And by the way, if you're using a chemical sunscreen, wait at least 15 to 20 minutes for it to absorb and to be effective.
First of all, remember that the SPF rating will give you the information about the UVB rays and not the UVA rays. And secondly, an SPF of 15 already blocks 93.3% of the UVB rays. So, so that's quite a good coverage. However, many people, including myself, don't apply enough sunscreen, especially those with acne prone skin and oilier skin types because they think that the sunscreen will break them out so most people only apply 25% or up to 50% of the sunscreen they should be applying and that means that the SPF rating drops dramatically that is why many professionals recommend using SPF of at least 30 or maybe even a 50 or a 50 plus so when we under apply we actually get an SPF of 15 or an SPF of 20 and that is still better coverage than maybe an SPF of 3 or a 4. Remember however that the SPF rating doesn't have to do anything with the UVA rays so nothing to do with the aging so don't believe the false claims of the manufacturers and the brands who tell you that the SPF of 100 or 150 will protect you better from aging than an SPF of 15 just because the SPF doesn't have to do anything with the UVA rays. Actually, all these extra ingredients used to achieve such a higher SPF are going to be irritating to your skin and that's of course not good. When it comes to reapplying your sunscreen, it doesn't matter too much if you apply a sunscreen of an SPF of 100 or a sunscreen with an SPF of 15 just because as we said the SPF does not correlate directly to the exposure time. The sunscreen actives get destroyed every time you expose yourself to UV light even if you are indoors and even if you are in shade there, there will still be some UV light present and the sunscreen actives will break down. And that's why it is so important to reapply your sunscreen, especially if you are in the sun for longer periods of time. You should follow the directions on the product on how often you should reapply, but generally you should reapply your sunscreen every two hours you spend in the sun. For example, if you put on sunscreen in the morning and you put on enough, then go to work for uh, 15 minutes, so walking to work for 15 minutes, then going for lunch for one hour and sitting uh, outside on a beautiful day, and then walking back home for 15 minutes, that's one hour and a half of sun exposure, of direct sun exposure per day, so you don't have to reapply. But if you did some sports or some work outdoors for more than 30 minutes that evening, then you would have to reapply. However, for an average working person in the modern world, applying once daily and applying enough is still going to be enough for a day. Be extra careful at the pool or at the seaside or doing sports in general because water and sweat will wash away some of the sunscreen and you will have to reapply more often and especially after you double dry because you will rub, physically rub the sunscreen away. If you are wearing makeup, it would be best that you would take that makeup off and re reapply properly. But if you cannot do that, then the next best thing would be to buy a, a pressed powder uh, with a high SPF and broad spectrum coverage and top your SPF off with a cushion. How to choose your sunscreen? So this is going to be a seven step process that I have put together for you to choose the best sunscreen for your face. I will only like to say that finding a perfect sunscreen for your face can be a really tough process and maybe you won't find a perfect sunscreen for you at this moment, but there are many sunscreens that are feeling nice on your face. Follow these steps and you should be okay. First, you have to decide if you want a chemical sunscreen or a mineral sunscreen. If you have sensitive skin, then mineral sunscreens would be better for your face. However, if you are from the EU or Asia, then I'd say first try the chemical sunscreens because they are not as irritating as the American sunscreens. But if you are from the US and you have sensitive skin, then try a mineral sunscreen. EU and Asia have far better chemical sunscreens 
but the uh, American mineral sunscreens are far better and there are many of them so really you can't go wrong with a good formulated mineral sunscreen in the US. As I've said in my next video I will be applying and reviewing sunscreens uh, and most of them are going to be from the EU but some are uh, also going to be from the US but if you are looking for a nicely formulated mineral sunscreen then you should check out the channel Hot and Flashy because uh, it's run by Angie, a woman named Angie and she looks amazing and she did amazing reviews on mineral sunscreens that are available uh, overseas so that means in America and yeah, you should check her out. She will be in the description box below uh, and also don't forget to watch my video as well. My second tip would be choose your SPF and make sure that your sunscreen has broad spectrum protection. That means it includes Abel Benzone, it includes Zinc Oxide or it includes uh, Tenosorb or it includes Juvenal A plus or some other form of broad spectrum protection. Also look at the uh, PPD ratings or the PA ratings. My third tip would be choosing if you want uh, water resistant sunscreen or not. If you are a very active person then choose a water resistant sunscreen and if not choose a normal sunscreen because they tend to be more elegant. My fourth tip would be choose the texture of your sunscreen according to your skin type. That means creams for drier skin types, lotions for normal skin types, gels for combination skin and liquids slash fluids for oily and acne prone skin. And as we said, if possible, avoid sprays and loose powders. My fifth tip would be look for other extra useful ingredients such as antioxidants and anti-irritants and these will be for example your vitamin C, vitamin E, green tea extract, licorice extract and many many more types of antioxidants and anti-irritants. My sixth tip would be avoid sunscreens that contain irritants and that would be your harsh preservatives, fragrances, aromas, then maybe drying alcohols. These drying alcohols are going to be listed as alcohol denatured or just alcohol, then you have ethanol or isopropyl alcohol, benzyl alcohol and many others. And you should avoid them if they are listed as one of the top ingredients in the ingredients list. My seventh and my final tip would be look at the price of the sunscreen and buy a sunscreen that you will be able to repurchase constantly. So don't buy a very expensive sunscreen and then don't use it so or use small amounts of it because it's not effective. Buy a affordable sunscreen and use it liberally and often apply it. So you have to choose a sunscreen that you will enjoy using and you will use gladly and reapply. Think of it like an investment in your skin's health and beauty. Okay, so the educational part is over and I've said everything I have to say about sunscreens. And now let's take a look at the frequently asked questions, facts and myths. And I have quite a few of these here. Uh, actually, I have 11 pages of script and four of these pages are only these questions and myths and facts. So let's get started. So the first dangerous myth is skin cancer is not dangerous. Mm, well, that is simply not true. Skin cancer, especially melanoma, can be one of the most dangerous diseases a uh, man can get. So that's not true at all. And I think that if you were about to say that to a person who has skin cancer, especially melanoma, they would say <laughs> quite a few words to you. The next myth is I have dark skin, so I'm okay. It is true that you have dark skin and it is true that you have more melanin than other people. However, you don't have enough melanin in your body, in your skin, to be immune to skin cancer and to skin aging. So, skin protection is still a must. The next myth is, I need a healthy tan to be protected from the UV rays. So, it is true that if you have a tan, if you have developed a tan, that you are more res resistant to the UV rays. However, this tan you have developed does not even compare with a sunscreen, with the sunscreen's effectiveness to block out UV damage. And as we said before, the tan you have developed is a consequence of the DNA damage. So you already have built DNA damage and that means 
higher risk for skin cancer. Let me say it again. There is no such thing as a healthy tan. The next myth is small amounts of sunshine are nothing bad. Well, it is true that small amounts of UV exposure are not as damaging as serious sunburns. However, these small damages and uh, amounts of UV exposure do accumula accumula uh, accumulate over time, so uh, you are still getting your skin cells damaged. Next up, we have a question. How long can I be in the sun until damage happens? The answer is not for too long, because after a few minutes of sun exposure, uh, the, the damage starts happening and collagen starts to break down and skin cells are damaged and free radicals start uh, formating so be especially careful if you have pale skin and the next question is at what age should i start wearing sunscreen and is it safe for babies meaning i think meaning up until six months old so on sunscreens you will find directions which will tell you that uh, you can use sunscreens on children that, that are older than six months and for children uh, for newborn babies up to six months old you need to ask a doctor but many professionals suggest that you simply don't expose babies to uh, sunlight and you cover them up uh, and after six months of age you can use a mineral sunscreen because they are more suitable for sensitive skin also be especially careful with babies because they cannot uh, produce sufficient melanin for their skin's protection so they're especially at risk the next myth is also age related and it says i'm too old for using sunscreen uh, i understand this as uh, I haven't ever used sunscreen and I'm too old to see results. No, you are never, never too old to start using sunscreen. I beg you start using it. The earlier you start, the better the results. And if you are older and you do some treatments, uh, some anti-aging tr treatments like uh, AHA, BHA peel, peels, uh, then some lasers or some other uh, surgical or non-surgical procedures done by a dermatologist you always need to apply sunscreen to protect your sensitive face so you are never too old to start wearing sunscreen the next myth is you don't need sunscreen in winter as we know uv radiation is present throughout the whole year so even if it's cloudy on a winter day the uva rays will st still penetrate the clouds and you are at risk especially if there's uh, snow on the ground because as we said uh, snow partially reflects the uv light the next myth is windows block uv uh, this myth is partially true because windows do block most of the uvb rays however they are not good enough at blocking the uva rays if you want your windows to block the uv rays almost completely then you have to install uh, UV protective films on your windows which will block most of the UV but let uh, through most of the visible light but keep in mind that you will have to replace all these films after a few years for example after three years or after five years uh, check all the all these UV protective films online and you should find a good one the next myth is Sunscreens are not effective or sunscreens cause a sunburn even though I use them. Um, this myth is simply a lie, a dangerous lie, because sunscreens are tested on humans for their performance and effectiveness. So the people who use sunscreen and still get burnt are usually the people who don't apply enough sunscreen and don't reapply or don't follow the instructions. I've seen this so many times, uh, a big family of four or five people goes to the seaside and they only take two or even one uh, five ounce bottle of sunscreen to the seaside and they have it for seven or ten days. That is not enough sunscreen for so many people, not even, not even near. So if you're using your sunscreen correctly, it should help prevent sunburn effectively. The next myth is an interesting one and it says the sunscreens prevent skin cancer. Now, the key word here is prevent. S sunscreens help prevent skin cancer. 
That, and that's because no sunscreen, even an SPF of 100, does block out all of the UVA rays or, or all of the UVB rays. No sunscreen is 100% effective. What sunscreens do is help to prevent skin cancer and skin aging and drastically reduce the possibility of developing skin cancer. And you must remember that the UV light, the UV rays, are one of the reasons of uh, skin cancers. And we still don't know all the factors of development of skin cancer. So, for example, think of infrared radiation. We don't have filters for infrared radiation. However, if we use sunscreen and protect ourselves from uh, the UV rays, we are already doing some good stuff for our skin. The next myth is quite dangerous as well and it says sunscreen causes cancer because we don't get vitamin D or because we don't get enough vitamin D through UVB. Well, the fact is that sunscreen helps prevent skin cancer and that's it. It is true that vitamin D is linked to skin cancer prevention. However, exposing yourself to the sun increases your risks of developing skin cancer. So just take a supplement or eat some fortified foods with vitamin D and use sunscreen and there you go. Plus, no sunscreen protects you 100% from the UVB rays, so you are still able to make some of, the, some of the vitamin D. Okay, the next myth is sunscreens filter out the good UVB rays, but not the bad UVA rays. So sunscreens are bad for me. I've seen this statement so many times on YouTube, uh, even by some doctors who argued with other people whether sunscreens are safe or not. But let me tell you this. Both UV rays, so the UVB and the UVA rays, cause cancer. It is true that most sunscreens filter out UVB rays far better than the UVA rays, so the balance isn't exactly optimal. However, if you are using a broad spectrum, stable and well formulated sunscreen, you should get enough protection from the UVA rays as well. And as I've said before, the newer chemical filters used in Europe and in the world are far better at protecting us uh, from the UVA rays than the US ones. But if you live in the US, then just use a zinc oxide based mineral sunscreen and you should be okay. The next myth says sunscreens are estrogenic. Well, uh, it is true, there's no denying that some sunscreen actives like oxybenzone and some other chemicals have estrogenic effects on the human body. However, many professionals say that the, this estrogen, estrogenic effect is minimal because the sunscreen actives don't absorb uh, in big enough doses and are not as biologically active as real estrogen to cause adverse effects. And the advantages of using sunscreens with these chemicals still outweigh the minor negative effects on the human body that are, I don't know, the estrogenic effects or some other effects. I just want to say if you are afraid of the estrogenic effects of these sunscreens, then you should think about the foods you eat, the foods we eat, uh, that have estrogenic activity, all the junk food, all the processed foods, and they are far worse for us and we eat them, not put them on our skin. Also, it is true that the FDA should update the uh, active sunscreen ingredients uh, and introduce ingredients like tenosorb and uvinol for better uh, protection and these newer ingredients don't exhibit the same estrogenic effects as these uh, outdated ones. But ultimately, if you don't like chemical sunscreens, there are also mineral sunscreens to consider. The next worrisome statement says, sunscreens produce reactive oxygen species. Um, that is true. As I said before, sunscreens are not 100% stable and after a certain amount of time uh, under a UV exposure, they degrade and then they start releasing uh, reactive uh, oxygen species or free radicals and um, uh, these are not good for our skin. However, the amount of free radicals and reactive oxygen species uh, produced is still far less if you are wearing sunscreen uh, than uh, going outside under the sun without sunscreen. And remember, these uh, rosses or free radicals 
are produced in the top layers of, your, of our skin, but if we don't wear uh, sunscreen, the rays go much deeper and produce them there, and that's far worse for our skin. And that's why it's also important to reapply your sunscreen to stay fresh and stable. The next myth is very widespread and it says retinol palmitate is dangerous. So for those of you who don't know, retinol palmitate is a form of vitamin A and I've written a huge paragraph on this topic, on this myth, so uh, I'm afraid I'm going to forget some infos, so it would be best if I read this paragraph to you, so bear with me. Okay, so I've written. Retinol palmitate is a form of vitamin A, and we know multiple forms of vitamin A, such as retinol palmitate, retinol, retinoic acid, slash tretinoin, and many other forms. In skincare, they, usually, uh, they are usually called retinoids, and they are a topic of hot debate. What they essentially do is speed up the proliferation or the dividing of the cells making your skin uh, firmer and less wrinkled, so they are an anti-aging superstar. They also help control oil, oil production and are often involved in the treatment of acne. Retinoids are also helpful in many different ways that many, uh, and they are so helpful that many label them as the best overall skincare ingredient. And it's true, they really are the gold standard, standard of dermatology. However, because they do speed up the proliferation of skin cells, they make uh, these skin cells a lot more sensitive to the sun. When skin cells are quickly proliferating or dividing, they sometimes don't have enough time to repair the DNA damage done by the UV, and that means mutations of the DNA, which can mean cancer. Additionally, they cause redness, irritation, and skin peeling, at the beginning of use. Now I will make uh, an extensive video about uh, retinoids, so vitamin A and the skin, uh, but let me focus on the retinal, palm retinal palmitate in this video and why it's supposedly bad in sunscreens. Retinal palmitate got its bad reputation when scientists put uh, retinal palmitate on mice and then irradiated them with UV. Mice developed tumors quicker than usual, so they concluded that retinal palmitate is dangerous under UV. First of all, mice are much more susceptible to skin tumors than humans. Secondly, retinal palmitate in sunscreens uh, comes in combination with sunscreen actives that filter out the UV, so our skin and the retinal palmitate are protected. And thirdly, retinal palmitate is an antioxidant that helps prevent free radical damage, so it actually helps us, and that's exactly why we should use it in sunscreens, or it is used in sunscreens. It is also one of the weakest forms of vitamin A, uh, because it has to transform to the more potent forms, and, is uh, and it's only used in small concentrations when formulated into a sunscreen. What I'm trying to say is, Retinol palmitate is safe when used in sunscreens, the only exception being for uh, preg pregnant women, uh, but they should avoid every form of additional vitamin A, and not just in cosmetics. Uh, but if you are afraid of retinol palmitate, then find a sunscreen without it. And there are many sunscreens without retinol palmitate, and they are also amazing, so you just have to shop around a little bit. The next myth goes, nanoparticles will absorb into your skin. You know what, I'm, uh, I'm just going to read these, these uh, few next ones. Okay, so nanoparticles will absorb into your skin. Nope. Healthy skin blocks the nanoparticles so they don't get past the epidermis. The, this is the top, the top layer of your skin. If they would get through, they wouldn't be able to do their job of protecting your skin. However, you can inhale nanoparticles in spray sunscreens or loose powders or lick them if you put them on your lips. Uh, but I also bet you didn't know that a small, almost nano-sized uh, particles of titanium dioxide were also used in supplements. And no one is afraid of those. Uh, the next complaint says, sunscreens burn my face so I cannot use them. Well, here's a little tip. 
Try a mineral sunscreen, so zinc oxide or titanium dioxide. They don't absorb your, into your skin, so the uh, irritation potential is very small. It's practically none. The next myth is also an, an interesting one and it says natural sunscreens are better. There are no natural sunscreens and this statement is only a marketing trick many natural sunscreen makers use. All sunscreen actives, including the mineral ones, so the more natural ones, are produced in the lab. That is a good thing, not a bad thing, because they are produced under strict circumstances so we can be sure they are effective and pure. The next myth is also nature related and it says plant oils and natural creams are as good as sunscreens. Um, this is also a very dangerous myth and I would like to say that they don't offer enough UV protection and um, they only have antioxidants which are superb for our skin but they don't really have that first line of defense of absorbing the UV rays. They only have antioxidants and these scavenge of the uh, remains of the free radicals. Uh, so once the damage has already happened, they clean that up so further damage won't happen, but they don't uh, defend us uh, in the first line. So we need sunscreens. We need proper sunscreen protection, not only oils. Here we have a complaint. Sunscreen makes me break out. Uh, don't use a cream or a lotion. Try finding a sunscreen that has a light texture, and a gel or a liquid or a fluid and you should be good. The next myth is super dangerous and it says I only need to protect my face. Um, now the sun's rays penetrate through almost anything, through many different types of fabric. So you need to protect your face, your neck, your hands and your body. Uh, especially in the warmer uh, seasons because the UV rays then are much more aggressive uh, and skin cancer strikes anywhere it can, it can reach. So every bit of body that the sun can reach is a potential for skin cancer. The next myth says lips don't need sun protection. Lips have super thin and translucent skin so they need extra protection. You don't want to lose a chunk of your lips because of skin cancer, do you? The next myth says water resistant sunscreens won't wash off. Um, water resistant sunscreens will wash off only at a much slower rate than normal sunscreens. So you still have to reapply and just to be sure, reapply at least every hour of swimming and directly after you towel dry it because you, then you rub it off. Uh, but for uh, more instructions, look at the back side of the product. Okay, the next myth is a very popular one and it says SPF in my makeup is enough for me. You don't apply 1.25 milliliters of foundation every day and that is this much. So you don't get enough UV coverage. Also, makeup uh, and foundations usually don't contain sufficient UVA protection, only UVB protection, so that protection isn't even broad spectrum because it doesn't have to be for makeup. So I'm, I'm not saying that uh, SPF in makeup is bad, it, it can actually help and boost your SPF uh, protection. But if you're using makeup as your only line of defense, then it's not enough. And now we have a question and it says, are moisturizers with SPF different than actual sunscreens? The answer is no. When a cosmetic product has an SPF rating, that means it's a sunscreen. So it, if a moisturizer, a daytime moisturizer of SPF 30, uh, has that SPF number on it, then it's an SPF 30 sunscreen. And it's almost the same as a SPF uh, 30 sunscreen. There, there's practically no difference. The ingredients might be the same. However, if you're using your moisturizer as your sunscreen, apply enough, so that means 1.25 milliliters for your face. So the next question is, how can some sunscreens with the same percentage of active ingredients have a different SPF number? And uh, this also has to do with the SPF claims and the SPF regulations, so let me explain this. Uh, okay, 
So every sunscreen is tested for the SPF rating. So we now take, for example, that a company makes a sunscreen and they want, want it to uh, be an SPF of 30. So they put 10% homocellate in and 3% avobenzone and 5% octocrylene and then they send it to testing and it comes back, it's an SPF of 35. So now they can make a claim that it's uh, SPF 30. And uh, then sunscreen makers uh, can make uh, SPF claims that are lower than the tested values, than the re results from the testing. So that means um, if I want an SPF of 30, but I got a result that my product is only an SPF of 25 when tested, I cannot make that claim. They only can make it uh, for, uh, an SPF claim for lower SPFs, if that makes any sense. And in that regard, now that they've made it uh, an SPF of 30, they can also make the exact same product and repackage it, uh, repackage it and make a claim for an SPF 15. So the same product with the same amount of actives can say this is an SPF 30 and here you have an SPF 15 because both products have an SPF tested of 35. So yeah, some, sometimes uh, sunscreen makers can do these things and it's okay. But if the product says it's SPF 30, then you know it's at least an SPF 30. Also, some people see that uh, some sunscreens with 10% zinc oxide have an SPF of 30 and then other uh, have only 3% zinc oxide for an SPF 30. And they, then they are afraid that that uh, sunscreen with 3% of zinc uh, oxide is not good enough or it's not protecting them. That's just too low of a percentage of zinc oxide and now an SPF 30 is still an SPF 30, so don't look at the percentages of sunscreen ingredients, just look at the SPF and the PPD and other ratings, so, and you should be good. The next sunscreen myth is also quite common and it says if I use a sunscreen rated SPF 30 and then I top that off with a foundation SPF 15, that equals SPF 45. Now sunscreens really don't work that way you can only rely on the SPF number which is the highest. So uh, in this case on the sunscreen rated SPF 30. You will get an effective SPF 30 and then some but not an SPF of 45. You will maybe get an SPF of 35 or 40 but not an SPF of 45. However if you use uh, and combine different SPF products it will boost your protection, so that's okay to do. The next question has to do with the previous question and it says, can I layer SPF products for better protection? Yes, however, make sure to apply as much sunscreen as possible to your face. Uh, I know that it's hard for some people because you cannot stand products sitting on your face, especially if you have oilier or acne prone skin types. Uh, so if you know that you always under apply your sunscreen, use broad spectrum makeup, uh, for example maybe primer and foundation, to bump up the SPF. The next question is, can I combine a mineral and a chemical sunscreen? So maybe a, a, a chemical sunscreen first and then with a mineral foundation, or even a, a chemical sunscreen first and then a mineral sunscreen for even better protection, uh, and this is uh, also suggested by many dermatologists. Um, usually, yes, usually you can do that because uh, most of the time the mineral sunscreens are coated with different coatings or they are big enough so they don't react with the chemical sunscreen. So, yes, you can do this. Okay, so I will also read the next question and answer. And the question is, my children hate using sunscreen, what should I do? Uh, and I wrote back, I cannot blame them, sunscreens can be uncomfortable. Make sure you find a, comf a comfortable, lightweight sunscreen that the children won't mind using. Also, make the process of applying the sunscreen into a game, like draw a happy face with a lotion or make a worm of their arm 
and make them put sunscreen on you so it will be fun for them too and they won't mind using sunscreen so it's the emotions that you should use here the next myth or the next question says last year's sunscreen is still okay and usually they are still effective because they must be stable for up to three years after being produced or made uh, and you should check the expiration rate uh, on the back side of the packaging or if the bottle has any indications on how long the sunscreen is still effective once you have opened it because I know that some sunscreens do have an expiration date of 12 months after you open them or even 9 months so you must check the label and now we have a question about UPF clothing how does UPF clothing work? Uh, if you don't know, UPF clothing is uh, clothing. First of all, UPF means uh, ultraviolet protection factor clothing. So it's basically sunscreen built into the fabric. Uh, well, there's no sunscreen, there's only the fabric and it's made in a way and from materials that absorb uh, the sun's rays far better than normal clothing like uh, cotton or I don't know, uh, silk. Also it is more dense and more thick and usually it comes in several colors so it really protects you from the sun. Uh, to read more about the UPF clothing and uh, to see what UPF clothing you can buy you should check uh, some description, uh, some links in the description below and yeah. And now we have the last question for today and this is how do I protect myself from the infrared radiation A or infrared? So we don't really have any infrared filters yet for topical use so your best bet would be to avoid sun, the sun exposure so don't get burnt or don't go out into the sun if it's not necessary and also eat foods that are rich in antioxidants, so fruits and uh, I don't know, vegetables and uh, also apply topical antioxidants and I will do a video about them in the future. So yeah, that's it. Whew, okay, so that was everything that I've written down about sunscreens for this video. There are still many things that we can say about sunscreens but I think this is enough for this one video. If you have any questions, if you have any comments, please leave them in the comment section below or send me a message and I will do my best to answer them. And also don't forget to check the description box below because there you will find all the studies and all the links and also all the links to other YouTubers who have made videos on, the, on this topic and uh, on sunscreen reviews. Also at this point I would like to thank everyone here on YouTube who has done a video on this topic uh, in the past. You have been a huge inspiration to me. I watched many 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 countless videos here on YouTube so a big thanks to you and I hope you continue your work and educate other people and of course a big thank you to my viewers. Thank you that you are watching my channel and I hope my videos are educating you and helping you. So don't forget to like, subscribe and share this video with your friends so they can watch it as well. Stay safe and I'll see you soon. Bye bye!